Hi there, it's Jeff here with another video. This time we're going to take a look at how you can challenge assumptions to help reach that top grade in your exams. Now, theories often rely on very simplified assumptions to help build complex real-world phenomena and also build simple models. But it is essential to recognise that oftentimes assumptions do not hold true in practice. So my advice to you is, where possible, do practice tests before your exam. Challenge underlying assumptions when writing your answers. I'll walk through with you eight examples where assumptions can and perhaps should be challenged. Here we go. The first is the assumption of rational behaviour. Now, the assumption here is, of course, that the consumers make their choices and their spending on different goods and services to act rationally to maximise utility, in the same way that firms try to maximise profits. But we know that behavioural economics shows that people often make irrational, predictably irrational choices due to biases such as anchoring, framing and loss aversion. People may overspend on premium brands due to perceived status of the brand rather than actual utility. So it is always worth challenging the assumption of rational behaviour. What about ceteris paribus, all other factors being equal? So economic models often isolate variables and assume ket par, all other factors being equal. However, in the real world, and I love this phrase, might be worth writing down in your notes. Multiple factors interact dynamically. Wow, what a phrase. Multiple factors interact dynamically. Let's take a simple income tax cut. In theory, it boosts people's disposable incomes and drives growth in the economy. However, if inflation erodes purchasing power, if you get some demand pull inflation, or uh, you make an assumption about low consumer confidence, people decide to save a tax cut, the impact of a tax fall can be muted, oftentimes negated quite sub substantially. So multiple factors interact dynamically, challenge the assumption of ceteris paribus. Oh, here's our old friend, the law of diminishing marginal returns. Now, I used to tell a very funny joke about marginal, marginal utility. Uh, I won't tell it again because it's just not as funny second or third time around. This law assumes diminishing returns occur after a certain point of factor usage. We add more labour to capital and beyond a certain point, marginal productivity goes down, marginal cost goes up. However, in many industries, this is simply not the case. We can drop this assumption, particularly those with significant technological advancements or learning effects, where returns increase with scale. And in sectors such as software and vaccines and other industries, a platform, uh, social media platforms, for example, scale can be achieved very quickly. So the assumption of diminishing returns can be challenged and the distinction between short and long run can, is not very helpful at all. Financial market efficiency. There is something called the efficient markets hypothesis. Sounds pretty grand, but it makes an assumption that all markets are perfectly efficient with the price of stocks and shares and bond yields and so on and so forth, reflecting all available information at every point in time. That assumption of financial market efficiency needs to be dropped. We know there are many frequent, persistent market anomalies, from speculative bubbles to commercial banking crashes, that demonstrate deep-rooted inefficiency in financial markets. And if you've seen the big short, you might understand that more. Behavioural finance highlights that emotions and speculation often act as drivers of market behaviour, not purely rational decision making. And that can cause persistent and frequent financial market instability, as we have seen. Our fifth one is that global trade benefits all parties. The assumption behind comparative advantage theory is that if you uh, find a if you find where your advantage is and you specialise under certain assumptions, free trade benefits all parties. Fine, and you can draw the theory in the diagrams and get the answer there. However, challenge the assumption. The gains from trade over time may not be equally distributed. We know from reality that many developing emerging countries face structural disadvantages, particularly when they're trading with high income nations or where they are negotiating with multinational companies. And trade can often widen existing income inequality if greater openness to trade leads to an increase in unemployment in some industries. So challenge that assumption. Three more. 
Higher minimum wage necessarily causes unemployment. The traditional theory, classical labour market economics, suggests that a higher minimum wage leads to job losses as firms cannot afford to hire as many workers. That's almost like an inbuilt assumption into the model. However, the data suggests, empirical studies, including the famous paper by Card and Alan Kruger 30 years ago now, show that modest increases in the minimum wage often have little or no effect on employment. In part because we're assuming things about productivity and labour turnover and consumer spending. And if uh, productivity goes up and labour turnover goes down and people spend the higher incomes, you can get an increase in employment. Don't assume automatically that a higher minimum wage causes unemployment. Two more to finish with. <clears throat> Hope you're finding this useful. Uh, developing economies benefit from FDI. So the challenge here is often assumed implicitly or explicitly, that FDI promotes growth in developing countries. And it can do. It can be a super important, important part of development finance. However, in some cases, FDI leads to repatriation of profits. It can lead to crowding out of local firms and increasing dependency on multinationals. And often those big TNCs may exploit lo local labour markets with their monopsony power and extract natural resources without significantly contributing to long-term development. The way to couch this in the exam is to say, well, FDI can stimulate growth and jobs and lift per capita incomes, but we shouldn't assume automatically this happens and then challenge that assumption. And that leads you into really good evaluation. Here's my last one. Immigration reduces the wages for native workers. So challenge the assumption that an increase in labour supply from high rates of net immigration leads to falling real wages for domestic workers. The evidence suggests that immigration often complements rather than substitutes native labour. Many migrants come in, fill those lower skilled jobs, uh, boosting overall productivity and output. They often help to relieve labour shortages and they increase the size of the economy, which increases labour demand and wages economy wide. <clears throat> immigration often doesn't lead to significant increases in per capita incomes, but it can lead to an increase in the size of GDP. So it doesn't necessarily reduce the real wages of native workers. That kind of inbuilt default assumption in economics is something that can and should be challenged. The theme of this presentation today is don't assume. Or if you do assume, have the confidence in the exam to challenge assumptions. You will get significant credit from uh, good, e good economics examiners. Thanks for joining in. Take care. Stay safe. Stay positive. Stay curious. See you sometime soon.